before I, t I talk about the, the topic for right now, let me uh, just give a, a sort of general w words of wisdom for those, because I, I realize a lot of people come here and, and a lot of you have read more stuff than even some of us on the faculty have read, and so sometimes we forget that some of you are only here because your professors in Austrian economics and told you to come here, and you might not even really know what Austrian economics is, and so there's a danger that some of you might slip through the cracks, even though in the, these early lectures we try to give you the foundation. So in, in case this hasn't been made clear, let me just recommend to you that if you want to just go, you know, one-stop shopping, Rothbard's Man Economy and State really is all you would need to read to to consider yourself well-versed in modern Austrian economics. Now, of course, that's sort of an, an overstatement or understatement. It's a, it's a thick, intimidating book. Uh, but it, it really is very well written, and if you just decide, you know what, I'm going to sit down and read this thing, it's, it it's, isn't actually as hard as it might seem. And then, of course, there is the study guide. Now, they already paid me the fee for this, so I'm not trying to uh, give myself any personal gain here. Um, but I did try to, in all honesty, uh, write this so that it, you could... You could see which chapters in Rothbard you wanted to, to delve into more deeply, so you could use the study guide to sort of get an overview, and then the stuff that really interested you, you could try to go to the main text. But really, it, reading Rothbard in the original, that's that's what you would need to, to consider yourself a modern Austrian economist. Uh, in contrast, something like Human Action, of course, is, is also extremely difficult to read, but Mises assumes the reader knows a lot. And so even if you just read Human Action and you didn't read anything else from the you know, history of economic thought, you might not have a full picture, because Mises makes references to things, and he makes brilliant points, but without having that background foundation, you wouldn't really know what to do with it, whereas Rothbard doesn't assume anything except that the, the reader's intelligent. So that's, um, so that's uh, my commercial for, for doing that. And la lastly, on this point, let me just say that if you're thinking, okay, yeah, at some point I should read that, if you don't do it now when you're young, you're not going to do it later. That, you know, you might be thinking, oh, I got my exams and everything, and I'm, and I'm just so busy that I have my lacrosse meet and all that. But wait till you're married and have kids. Okay? Then you realize how little free time you actually have in your life. So, so this really, uh, just as, um, to give you an example, when, when I had a, we had our son, I had one a son, and uh, it was about a month after he was born, and I literally had been getting about four hours of sleep per night for a month. And some of you might think, well, that's not too bad. You know, sometimes I've been playing cards and I go to bed at 2 and then I have to get up at 6 to go to work. Four hours, isn't it? But you know how many hours you're going to get beforehand. And when you lay down to sleep, you set your alarm and know I'm going to get four solid hours. When you have an infant, that's not the case. So even when you're, you know, getting to sleep, you're still nervous. And so it's totally different. And, um, and I just, in the cafeteria during exam week, like I said, when I had been, you know, I was basically a zombie at this point, just, you know, walking dead because I'd been getting four hours of sleep a night for a month. And I heard some kids in the student union complaining. They were like, I've been studying for this calc test for 48 hours straight, you know, and I just wanted to laugh at them. They, they thought that was... Okay, so anyway, the point, the point of all that, uh, besides the work and the joke in the beginning, was that you, uh, if, if you want to read this stuff, really, now is the time to do it because you're, you're never going to do it if you just say, oh, I'll read it sometime when I'm, when I'm not so busy. Okay, so what am I talking about today? Uh, this lecture, it's capital and interest theory. Now, let me warn you, this... This really is complicated stuff. I'm trying to strike a balance here between giving the basics to people who have never heard this before, but also to go over some of the subtleties for people who are a little bit more advanced and, and they say, oh, I want to come to Auburn to hear it from the people who really are experts on this stuff. So I'll try to strike that balance. Also, let me, um, I've, I've heard that upstairs the overheads aren't coming through uh, as clearly as, as one might hope, and so I'll try, I, I do have a lot that I'm going to be pointing to, but I'll try to to say what I'm pointing at just to make sure I'm not losing people who are watching this upstairs. So let's jump right into it here. And I'm sure this is going to be upside down the first time. Okay. And I was told to just wait, be patient. Okay. All right, so that looks right to everybody. Okay, and then let me do this and not give you the freedom to look ahead and force you to go at what I want to look at. Okay, because too many options, you know, that's suboptimal. Okay, so the standard definition, um, capital goods produced means of production. And let's, so this is what you, this isn't just an Austrian definition, this is what, you know, a standard economics definition would be. And the, let's just break that up into two different parts here. 
So the, uh, the produced part, that's pretty straightforward, meaning it's not found in nature that human beings made the thing. And then the means of production, that just signifies that it's as opposed to a ca- uh, consumption good. All right, so a television set is produced by human beings also, but in most applications, it's a consumption good, so that wouldn't be considered capital. But even there, uh, I should stress that these aren't, this isn't an objective criteria on that it depends on the subjective plans of people, as, as you've learned in these lectures so far. The Austrians are very big proponents of the subjectivist revolution in economic theory, and even though other schools would pay lip service to the fact, oh yeah, we believe in subjectivist price theory, the Austrians really, I think, take this um, to its logical conclusion. And you find that here as well, that when you want to say, is a particular good, is it supposed to be, a, is it a capital good or a consumption good, it depends on the plans, the subjective intentions of the person who's using it. So just to take that example I was using right there, a television set, yeah, if, if somebody goes into Best Buy and buys a television set and brings it home and they're watching DVDs on it, that's probably, we'd say, okay, that's a consumption good. But what if I told you, that no, it's a law student and the person's just watching tutorials on how to try cases or how to, you know, use the, the legal databases and things like that. Then you might say, well, actually, maybe that's, that should be considered a, a capital good. Maybe the person's really not using it for, for pure entertainment, but just to train himself. Uh, to give you a couple other examples, one I like to use is uh, the, the diary of Anne Frank, right? the girl that actually was writing into that diary. For her, that was a consumption good. Right, that she was keeping her, her notes there. But then after the war, when some publisher got his hands on that, he looked at that thing as a means to selling a lot of books. And so for him, that was a, a capital good. Or a different example, if you are sitting on a street corner, if you're on a street corner and you're strumming your guitar, you're not really paying much attention to what's going on around you, that could be a, a consumption good, that you're just using the, that instrument to give you uh, utility directly. But then if people are walking by and they like what you're playing and they start throwing money into your hat, then all of a sudden that could be a, a means to achieving income and so it could turn into a, a capital good. All right, so the point is nothing technologically or physically changed in these things from the exa- in the examples. It's switched between being a consumption or a capital good based on what is the intention of the person using it. Okay, so again, just another example of in economics, just about everything ultimately gets filtered through people's minds, all right, so, so yes, I can, it's not pure nihilism, it's not just, oh, it's ever in your head, and there's nothing ob- objective about it, but everything ultimately works through people's subjective uh, intentions and, and value scales, and that's what, that's what uh, makes this subject, at the one hand, so interesting, but also so difficult, and why efforts to just take the methods of the natural sciences and just ape them in uh, in the social sciences, a lot of times they don't they don't work out because really the, the two fields are different. And what happens is because people are so we're so good in everyday behavior that or everyday civilization that we understand how things get filtered through other people's minds and we don't even realize that we're automatically filling in things and, and reacting to events based on other people's mental filters. We, we do that so quickly and automatically that people don't even realize they're, that that's what's going on. And so when they try to study the social sciences, they say, oh, let's be scientific and do what the physicists do when they study molecules, and that's how we'll study human beings. And it, it doesn't work out, obviously. Okay, but this is the standard definition. Now, just a little uh, technical point here. So I have here a, a better definition would be the capital goods really would be the reproducible means of production. And here the issue is, if you think about it, it's generally speaking in economics, what happened in the past is rather irrelevant, right? That bygones are bygones, uh, sunk costs are sunk. Okay, so there's all these examples you have of how things in the past really don't matter. What matters to the acting person is his environment right now, his preferences right now, and his expectations of the future. And so the, the historical origin of a particular object that's in front of him really isn't all that relevant for economic theory, or it would be odd if it were relevant. And so if somebody, you know, if you have, a, let's say, a spear, and you say, okay, there, this was some uh, people went out and they chopped down the tree and then they, they sharpened it and they, they made it into this, this spear and they're going to use it to go hunt, we'd say, okay, that's, that's a capital good. It's produced and it's um, not directly useful, but they're going to use it to achieve... Uh, more food in the future, so that's why it's a capital good. But what if there's a freak bolt of lightning that hits a tree branch, and it just so happens that the thing that ends up from that process is identical, is interchangeable as far as the hunters are concerned with 
the spear that they made. Well, then the question is, well, is this a part of natural resources or is it a capital good? And it would be odd to say, no, this is a, a natural resource because nature provided it, whereas this thing is a capital good because humans made it, even though if we switched them, the hunters wouldn't care. All right, so it's a, it's a contrived example, but I'm just trying to get you to see that it's not the historical origin really that's, that matters, even though economists traditionally, that was the way they thought of it. Um, in terms of, you know, why, so why is it reproducible? Why does that matter? And again, this is a little bit of a technical point. So if, if I lose you here, it's okay. I'm going to come back to this later on, but for those of you who can follow this, I just want to, to fill this gap in the, in the lecture here. So the, the reason that it would be better to define it as reproducible is because then, first of all, that's forward-looking, that if something's reproducible, that's talking about how things in the future um, influence our current behavior, but also that that dovetails with the uh, construction of the evenly rotating economy. And again, this is going to be a little bit advanced, but what, what Austrians find is that in the evenly rotating economy, capital goods, they earn gross rent, but not net rent. All right, only the original factors of production, labor and natural resources, earn net rents in the ERE, the evenly rotating economy. So again, I'm going to come back to this at the end of the lecture if you're losing me here, but let me just give you a little hint right now of what I'm talking about. The idea is if um, in the evenly rotating economy where people understand, they, they perfectly anticipate the future, so nothing unexpected happens, and the conditions just repeat themselves over and over, you still will have uh, interest. You'll still have, uh, again, I'm, I'm jumping ahead, time preference, and, and, and factors of production won't be bid up to their the prices of the products they're, they're going to yield, but there won't be any profits. And what happens there is if you have a machine that you know it takes labor, it takes iron, it takes copper, it takes other natural resources to produce, if all the profits get competed away because everything just keeps repeating itself over and over in the evenly rotating economy, what you'll find is it can't possibly be that the producer of that machine earns a net income that can't be attributed to the, the earnings of some other original factor, whether it's his own labor or he goes out and hires other workers or he hires or he buys copper from the people who own copper mines. Okay, so that, that's the idea that if something's reproducible, it can't persistently earn a net income, that any income it's getting when you sell that machine, the money you get for it, you could decompose that gross price into, oh, wait a minute, yeah, this machine costs 10000 but 1000 goes to the workers who worked on it, and 1000 goes to the copper that went into it, and there's nothing left over to the business of machine production. Okay, so that's, um, that's why reproducible is really the, the appropriate term here, because it, dove, it dovetails with, that, with this point that Austrians make about the evenly rotating economy. Okay, so back now to more basic ideas. So I say here, an important necessity and distinction is capital goods versus just capital. And so this is something that Mises in particular stresses a lot, and then his uh, disciples, if you want to use that term, try to stress it as well. And this really separates them from the mainstream. Now, so far, I haven't said anything that I think would, would scandalize a mainstream economist. They would probably wonder, why am I wasting so much time on these really trivial definitions? But it's important. And in today's talk, I'm not really going to be able to give you too many specific examples. I'll give you one or two to show why the Austrian obsession with these methodological definitional foundations actually yields different policy conclusions or different um, analytical results. But up till now, everything I'm saying is fairly straightforward. And like, as I said, a mainstream economist, if they were going to criticize this, would probably just say, yeah, this is basics of why you're wasting so much time on this. Let's get into the economics. But here's a, an example of what I mean, that a lot of times mainstream economists, they will use just the term capital, and they, they're sloppy with it, that they'll switch back and forth, that sometimes they'll be referring to physical objects out there, capital goods, and other times they'll mean financial capital. So we already know what capital goods are, and what do I mean by financial capital? So in, in the context... If, you, if an Austrian is writing, certainly Ludwig von Mises, if he's talking about capital, and you know, like I say, if, if it's clear that he doesn't mean capital goods, what he means is financial capital, and that refers to the the net amount of money invested in an enterprise. All right. So again, for people upstairs, let me just make sure you can see this. 
This is when in context, not referring to capital goods. Capital means financial capital. In other words, the sum of money prices for assets related to an enterprise minus the financial obligations. So to, to give you an example, um, you, maybe your friend r- runs a laundromat and you could say to the person, oh, how much capital do you have invested in that, in that enterprise? And he'll probably give you a number. Like he might say, oh, $300,000. And so what he means is if I were to sell off all of the assets, the, the machines in there, the property, uh, whatever else I have, you know, money, money in the checking account that's devoted to that firm, and then pay off all of my debts, that, you know, maybe he borrowed money from people in order to start the business, whatever's left over, that's how much of my capital is tied up in that enterprise. And so when he makes calculations to say, gee, should I keep running this business or should I liquidate it and put my money in something else, I mean, the number he has in mind as to what could I pull out of this if I just decided to quit is how much of his capital is tied up in it. All right, so another example, if, if you know, something, there was an accident and the place got leveled and then he couldn't do it anymore, and you, you know, like how much does he feel like he's out, he could say, oh, well, you know, the amount of capital that I had invested is now gone, something like that. Okay, so that's what, what capital means in that sort of generic context, and that's totally different from saying what types of capital goods are devoted to that enterprise, because then he'd be talking about physical things. He'd say, oh, there's the the dryers, the washing machines, the, the vending machines that have the little individual detergent boxes and things like that. And so those would be capital goods that are involved. So I, again, this is a very straightforward distinction, and a mainstream economist would say, okay, okay. But when you start reading mainstream papers and reading their theories, they switch back and forth a lot between these two ideas that we're trying to explain when it comes to interest theory, what we're trying to see there really is why is it that a certain amount of financial capital earns a net return per unit of time? All right, so that's, and don't worry if you're losing me here, well, I'm anticipating, we'll come back to this. But the idea is interest really is about if you have a certain amount of, of financial wealth today, why is it that you can invest it and earn a certain proportion of itself back per unit of time? And mainstream economists try to answer that question by focusing on physical things. They want to look at physical capital goods, and they think if they make statements about capital goods, that will, they've just talked about capital, and so that explains the return to capital. Okay, and so that, again, um, I'll be more specific about the the flaw in that thinking, but it really comes back to this Misesian distinction between capital versus capital goods. And so again, it's, it's not merely that Mises is just being very methodical in his writing when he is very clear about capital goods versus capital, but it's also an important theoretical distinction for for Austrians, whereas for other main, for mainstream economists, they don't really take that much care because for them, it doesn't really make a difference. It's capital. Now this also, you'll see, and you'll see this stress during the week, but I, I was struck by this. As uh, Mark mentioned, I'm working on a, a study guide to human action, and I, I've read that book several times now, and this latest reading, it's just blowing me away how much Mises bases his view of the economy on the importance of economic calculation. And I mean, I knew he, he stressed it before, but just this, this latest reading, I just can't believe how everything is, is really just, that's the essence of it. And you need, you need market prices for capital goods for that, and that's the only way you can really compute the amount of, ca- of financial capital devoted to an enterprise. So the two are related, Capital goods and capital are related, but the point is you need to have market prices for the capital goods in order to compute a number and say how much capital is invested in IBM, for example. All right, because without those market prices, statements about how much total capital really are sort of metaphorical. All right, that you know you can say things like, well, does Zimbabwe have less capital than the United States does, and we, we all we all know the answer that's got to be yes, but really, strictly speaking, you know, you say, well, how could you come up with a procedure to really, you know, what if we, we pick countries that were closer together, or we said the U.S. in 1975 versus the U.S. in 1977, and you weren't sure with inflation and what happened if if there was capital consumption or something like that, and you wanted to know, well, how do you how do you measure aggregate capital? Again, it's it gets a little bit difficult. At the micro level, it's very straightforward. An individual business person, when you say how much capital is devoted to this factory or how much is devoted to your advertising department, they can go ahead and, and estimate and say, well, if we liquidated it, we could sell the assets for this much. 
then we'd pay off our, our uh, creditors, and then whatever we had left, that's the, the net capital that's invested. But when you start talking about how much is in the United States, it gets a little problematic because you could say, well, if, if everyone in the U.S. decided to sell all of their capital goods, how much could they raise? And then if they paid off all of their creditors, you know, so it gets complicated. And then if you say how much capital is in the world, again, what, you know, are we going to sell it to Martians? Or you, know, so you see the problem. All right. So whereas mainstream economists, again, they are thinking, and of course I'm using a broad uh, brush here, but this, what I'm saying is definitely true of their standard models, is they tend to think of capital as a collection of physical machinery, and, and so for, in their mind, like, to measure aggregate capital is very straightforward. It's just, well, how many machines do you have, or how much of this particular tool do you have? Okay, and then another point is that Karl Marx, he used the term capitalism, and he he meant it as a smear term. All right, So he thought he was being derogatory, that if he just established that, you know what this market system, this laissez-faire that, that we, we practice, it's basically capitalism. And what, what he meant by there, if you think about it, he was contrasting it with socialism. And if you just, for a moment, can divorce yourself from your knee-jerk hatred of the word socialism, just think about what the word sounds like. It's like, oh, so socialism is a system that directs resources to all of society. It's a social system, whereas what does capitalism do? It directs resources for the ends of the capitalists. All right, so if that's the way you're thinking about it, socialism sounds great and capitalism sounds horrible. And But but Mises actually embraced the term, and he said even though Marx intended it as a smear, it actually is a very good description because pr the system of private property rights or laissez-faire capitalism really is bound up with this notion of capital. And so, as I said, again, Mises' economics, uh, it, it really is amazing how just on every issue you, you look at, it always comes back to there need to be market prices for capital goods, for the means of production, and that allows economic calculation. And if you don't have those things, you really can't even do economics. All right, so just to give you, to anticipate something that you'll learn, I, th I think tomorrow, I think Joe Salerno does this lecture about economic calculation, the, the problem with socialism is not merely the incentives and, think, and um, the, the worries about what happens if a really bad uh, sadomasochist gets in power, that you, know, you don't want to have that much power vested in a particular position politically, but beyond that there's this issue of economic calculation where uh, people, the so central planners won't be able to use market prices to determine whether they're using society's resources correctly. And again, the... the uh, Mainstream economists, the mathematical economists, they thought they were, they were coming with all these clever ways to get around the problem that relied on formal uh, Walrasian economic theory. And again, they just always were assuming away the basic problem, which is that you need market prices, prices formed in a market where there's different property owners haggling over the distribution of property titles and, and generating exchange ratios, which are market prices, against a common medium of exchange. All right, so all these things that mainstream economists sort of abstract away from really just keep coming back and back no matter what the particular topic is. And so again, that's why uh, Mises thought that capitalism actually was, it was a good description of, of the system of private property. Okay, let's move on here. So now... You've probably seen some version of this, and this actually carries through into everyday usage with these, some of these terms. And again, for the benefit of people who can't read us upstairs. So I say the erroneous classical understanding, meaning the classical economists, how did they view things? And so they thought there were three different factors of production, and that's still, we still have this uh, classification system. But where we, where modern economics differs is the classical economists thought there was a certain type of income that corresponded with each of the different types of uh, production factors. So they thought that rent was just the thing that land earned. All right, and, w and when they said land, they they meant natural resources in general. So if you owned a copper mine, that was land. All right, and wages were what labor earned, and capital earned either profit or interest because the classical economists, they didn't have the distinction that we have today about gross accounting profits versus the true returns to um, entrepreneurial activity. 
All right, so, so modern economics means some, profit means one thing and interest means something else, whereas for the classical economists, many of them just meant how much are you earning over and above the money that you spent on your inputs. Okay, so that, this is what the classical economists thought, and I had that word erroneous, but again, to make sure you're, you understand, so this, this is wrong, okay? So don't, I know some people start dozing, they write stuff, and I don't want you to walk away saying, well, if I, if I retain nothing else, at least I had this nice table that Dr. Murphy gave us. <laughs> All right, so, so this, this is wrong, and it's, I'm not going to be able to really give you the, the full view of why it's wrong, because you need to learn things that, that you'll learn tomorrow and then later on in the week, but let me just try to show you why, th why this can't be right, that you're going to just tie yourself up in knots mentally if you, if you try to, to push this through. So the first example was actually one that Irving Fisher came up with, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but it, this is where I got the idea from. So he says, suppose there's a capitalist who spends $100,000 on a parcel of arable land, and then he rents it out every year for $5,000 to tenant farmers. Okay, so he owns the land. He, he had $100,000 in cash saved up. He bought this piece of land, and then every year these farmers pay him $5,000. All right, so now this, so he gets an, you know, he has an annual stream now of $5,000 payments. He can go to the movies with it, go to the restaurant, whatever, and he just gets, keeps getting his $5,000 per year, assuming his land remains arable and economic conditions don't change. So the question is, how do we classify those payments? Well, on the one hand, you might be tempted to call them rent because, after all, the tenant farmers are thinking, I'm paying for the use of this land. I mean, if that's not rent that you're paying to a landlord, then what, you know, what would count as rent? That's the classic definition. But on the other hand, he might view it as a 5% return on his invested capital. And so they should be considered as interest payments. All right? And so, for example, if suppose that he had perfectly safe bonds that were paying 8%, he might decide to sell that land and then take the hundred thousand and buy bonds with it and then earn eight percent, earn eight thousand dollars a year instead of five thousand. Okay, so the point is, it's you, you're going to tie yourself up in knots if you try to rely on this uh, classification system because what ends up happening, and, and here again I'm, I'm anticipating a little bit, but the the Austrian view is that the the current price of a durable good is actually the the discounted value of the anticipated rental payments. So when you're deciding, do I want to buy this arable land, really what the farmer or what the capitalist does is he says, okay, well, it'll give me 5000 this year, it'll give me 5000 next year, 5000 the year after, and he just pictures in his mind the stream of payments that it will yield him, and then he applies a discount rate because a dollar accruing 20 years from now is not the same thing as a dollar accruing today. And then he comes up with a, what's called the present discounted value. Right? So for those of you who have taken accounting, you understand that's, that's the way you compute the, the current value of a, of a cash flow. And that's the way you come up with the present price of something. Right? And so this principle doesn't just apply to bonds that, you know, that have a certain dividend payments, and then you get the principal back after a certain amount of time. And how much should I pay right now for that bond, given what the interest rate is? So yeah, it works there, but Austrians think it works in general. That's a more general principle that when you value present goods in terms of money and it's a capital good, that what you're really doing is you're saying, what are the yields it's going to give me over time? And you figure out the present value of that. Okay, so again, it's, it's both rental payments for the land, but also it's an implicit interest return on the invested capital. And so that's why this can't possibly be right. To give you a, a different example, of why this can't be right. Uh, many of you may know that Tom Woods writes a lot on the Confederacy. He's been accused of being a racist and loving slaves. And so I am making this counterexample where I'm uh, talking about slaves. And again, I'm putting in the ha-ha to make sure no one walks out of here saying, Dr. Murphy said Tom Woods likes slavery. Um, I'm not saying he doesn't, but I, I just don't know. <laughs> so again, you get, I'm just changing the factor of production. Suppose back in the Deep South, plantation owner spends $100,000 buying slaves at an auction, and then he, you know, so he owns these human beings legally, and then he rents them out to other, you know, he he, he doesn't need that many. They, they, he's got other people, other plantation owners actually can use their labor more than he can on his own land, and so he rents them out. So his his property goes down and works every day on his neighbor's field, and the neighbor pays the owner uh, $5,000 annually. All right. So the question is, are these payments wages or interest? 
And again, you might say, well, it's, it's a payment for labor, so surely it's, it's a wage. But on the other hand, he could compute what is the rate of return on my invested financial capital. And should I put my money into slaves or should I put my money into bonds or into, you know, shipbuilding, another enterprise? Okay, so again, it's um, once you realize how it is that present prices are computed and you realize the role of what's called time preference, how future payments are discounted for the, into their present value, once you realize that whole system, which again you, will be fleshed out during this week, then it becomes obvious of how really inadequate that classical understanding was. But again, that, we still see that today, that you pay rent to your landlord, and we still, you know, we still talk about wages that labor gets, and you think that your you know, capital, is, capital earns interest return. All right? So it's, you, we still retain a lot of that, that uh, usage, but really everything that's productive earns a rent in terms of um, modern Austrian economics. That, that so a, a rental payment is not something that just goes to the owner of land. That in a sense, a worker rents out his labor service or rents out his body, if you want to think of it that way. Okay, so rent is a much more general concept than, the, than what the classical economists thought. Okay, so now I think there's a lot of different ways you could approach um, capital and interest theory in the Austrian tradition. I did a lot of work on Bombavik, and so that's I'm drawn to this. And I think, though, that if you understand historically where how Bombavik tackled this problem, then especially if you read Mises, but even Rothbard, it'll make more sense as to why are they approaching the problem the way that they do. So what, so what Bombavik, and, and he was, I think you, you've probably already seen the chronology, but he was, came after Menger and was before Mises. So his, um, his view was that he said, okay, the interest problem, so what is it as a, as a, as a scientist, as an economist, what am I trying to explain when it comes to interest? And the way Bombavik framed the problem is he said, okay, what happens is, as a regular matter of course, is people with with financial capital, they can go out into the markets and they can buy land, labor, and capital goods and they know that they'll be able to transform them into finished products and sell them at a future date for more money than they ended up, than they originally spent. Okay, so just for concreteness, I'm saying suppose the capitalist can put $100,000 into inputs and then a year later sell the finished product for 110000 and so Bombavik originally framed the problem. He said, what we have to explain then when it comes to interest is why is there this apparent undervaluation of the factors of production? All right. So because if we know the, the product they yield can be sold for 110000 why aren't entrepreneurs bidding up the prices of the inputs to 110000 That if, if you're walking down the street and on, on the right side you saw apples selling for a dollar a pound, and on the other side of the street, you saw the same quality of apples selling for $2 a pound, you would wonder, how can this persist? How come people aren't buying apples at a dollar here and then walking across the street and selling them for a dollar ninety? Okay? And so you would, you would wonder, how can this, this difference in prices persist? And so the same thing here, if you can buy the inputs for 100 grand, how come you can sell the output for 110 if everyone knows this, right? So there's, there's risk and things like that in the real world, but he was saying, come on, Capitalists know for certain established enterprises that they're going to earn a return on their on their money, and he he called that originary interest. Okay, um, I, I have that later on, but it it's um you can see how it's spelled out, but it's the term is originary interest, and so for Mabavik, originary interest referred to the interest on your cap your financial capital that you can earn by buying factors of production and then selling the proceeds you know the physical product they yield later on for more money that gap between how much you spent on the inputs versus how much you got from the output is originary interest all right so he's viewing it as an undervaluation problem why is it that entrepreneurs aren't bidding up that to 110 or going the other way how come they don't keep doing this how come people don't keep rushing into this industry until the point where the, the factors of production's prices get bid up, and then because more and more of this product is getting made, its price doesn't get pushed down until, you know, so maybe they meet at 105000 Okay, then this is just a schematic, and we'll come back to this later on. And the idea is, 
um, r- really to understand this, now this is why it gets a little bit tricky, is you're going to have to think of things in terms of different time periods. And so in, in my lecture today, it's not going to get too intense, but if you really delve into this literature, stuff can get really complicated with people spending money and prices on a certain time, and then you're trying to refer to, well, what's the spot price of something three years from now versus what is the three-year futures price right now for that thing. And so stuff gets complicated, and you got to keep keep track of what you're saying. Um, but like I said, for this lecture, it won't get too complicated. So again, the idea is how come August 1st this year we can spend 100000 one year later sell, let's say it's a house, for 110000 Why is that possible? So what one theory is what Bambaver called the naive productivity theory. And... There was actually, Bambaver went through a whole host of, of proposed solutions to the interest problem, and in his mind, he, he demolished them all. And again, if, if you're interested in that stuff, if you like to read some like, scathing critiques that are sort of humorous but also very informed, I would highly recommend Bambaver's critiques of other interest theories. It's the kind of thing where you know, he, he, he sets up the opponent, and then he knocks him down, and then he says, oh, but, but let's suppose I couldn't use that argument. Let me build you back up. Oh, but you're wrong for this reason. He knocks him down a different way. And so there's like three different reasons you're wrong. And by the way, my exposition of your point was better because you're so stupid. Right? So, <laughs> I mean, this, really, this, this is um, the kind of thing he does where, you know, he'll quote someone and say, now, he made a little slip here, but let's give him that. And then, then you know, knock down the essence of his theory three different ways. Okay, so the naive productivity theory was just one among many, but this is crucial to understanding um, Mises and Rothbard's discussion of, of interest theory and, and why um, you'll see such hostility towards the, the, any productivity explanation when it comes to interest. Okay, that's because it all goes back to Bambaver's critique of this. So the, what Bambaver called, obviously the proponents didn't say, I believe in the naive productivity theory. Um, so this is Bambaver's term, obviously. And he's saying that some people just say, oh, well, the return to capital, in other words, originary interest, is due to the fact that capital is productive. And so for these people, it was just obvious that, look, you, if you incorporate capital goods into a production process, you get more product or you get a better quality product than you could get without the contribution of capital goods. And so, of course, doing that yields you a net return. You know, how, how could, if, if you're a, a farmer and you say, okay, I can plant the seeds and then I, you know, I have water and so forth and I can just use, um, regular handheld tools, or I can go get a tractor, and this guy from Bobber wants to know why is it that with a tractor I can sell the, the crops a year later for a higher price than I put into it. Well, obviously, it's because the tractor is physically productive, and so I can grow more crops with the tractor. I mean, that's, that's straightforward. How, what's the problem here? And Bambaverick's point was, well, no, that, that doesn't, that, that's not even an answer. That doesn't have anything to do with the problem. What he was trying to explain, remember, is why is it, if we go up to this example again, why is it that this 100,000 here persists at a level below this 110,000? And so if you tell me the reason these combination of goods is undervalued by 10 grand is because they're so productive, not only does that not make sense, but that's actually the opposite of an answer, right? That it, the, the, Really, the, the person would have to be giving you a reason as to why these were somehow deficient. Because again, what Bambavar, the way he's framing it, is he's trying to explain why is there this under, apparent undervaluation. And so to say that capital goods are productive not only doesn't give you the answer, it actually, on the face of it, is, makes the problem even harder to understand. Okay, So, again, that's, uh, that's the naive productivity theory. And again, the reason he calls it naive is because that was the basis of their theory. That's what they said, oh, capital is productive. Or they might have added, you know, elaborated and said because you can produce more with capital than without. So to... Just to try to reinforce that, the, of course capital goods are productive, and that's why they have a market price. That's why entrepreneurs are willing to pay money for capital goods, because they know if I buy capital goods, that will allow me to sell more product or sell a product of a higher quality to fetch more revenue. But again, the question is not why is the price of the lumber or the saws or the nails that go into the house, why, why is the price not zero? The question is how come the prices aren't bid up to the level at which there is no net return? That's the issue. And so if you tell me because I can build a better house with nails, that doesn't explain why the nails are selling for a dollar a package instead of a dollar twenty-five a package, okay? So what was Bambavrick's solution? He 
he said that present goods are preferred to future goods, assuming that we're talking about um, the, sa- the same number and quality. All right, and if you, I'm not gonna today or right now have time to get into Bumbavik's reasons for why this is this statement is true, and also because there's a lot of controversy within Austrian circles, but Austrians all do agree that that this is the to understand the solution. This is the first step. Okay, so if you just accept for the moment that that happens to be true, you'll see that, that easily solves the, this, this interest problem, the way Bumbavik sets it up. Okay, so let's take a detour for a minute. We look out in the market and we see that a pound of steak sells for more than a pound of hamburger. And why is that? Is it because it costs more to produce steak than it does to produce hamburger? No, because it's from subjectivist price theory, we know that that's, that's the wrong angle, that the way you explain market prices is through subjective marginal utility. And so if in equilibrium, day after day, steak consistently sells more, than, ha- than hamburger does, for, for more than hamburger does, it must be because consumers have a higher margin utility for a pound of steak than for a pound of hamburger, or at least enough consumers have that, so that's the way the prices work out. Okay, so that's, that's pretty straightforward, and there's no, there's no um, apparent undervaluation of hamburger meat going on here. Right? There's no mystery. That's the answer. All right, so if you then put it into an intertemporal context... I use some high-powered graphics here. Um, and, and incidentally, you guys are all benefiting. In previous Mises universities, I've been doing this stuff by hand. And, and believe me, you're uh, benefiting from the fact that I switched over to, the, to these graphics here. Um, what if, I'm saying, so August 1st, 2008, how much would you spend for this particular house right now? That the house is built, it's right there for you to move in tomorrow. How much would you be willing to spend for it? It's $110,000, let's say. That's the market price for this house. On the other hand, suppose there is a market for these claims, these pieces of paper, these legally enforceable contracts that say, I owe you one house, and it's a house of comparable uh, you know, square footage and location. And everything else is identical. The only difference between these two things is that this doesn't give you the house until the year 2009, so it's exactly 12 months later delivery. And then I say to people, or, you know, this thing sells in the market, there's supply and demand for it, and we look, what's the equilibrium market price? And I think most people would agree it's reasonable to assume it would be less than $110,000, that people right now would not pay as much for a house that's not going to be available for one year as they would for a house immediately available. All right, so again, it, right, so especially now Mark says. Right, so the point... And, and again, um, you know, you could, you could worry about, well, is it because you're afraid the person's going to skip town? Even if you were, were absolutely sure that this IOU was going to be fulfilled, again, just the, the mere fact of, of that time interval, that time lag, probably the equilibrium market price would be lower than 110000 And again, as a subjectivist economist, you say, why is that the case? You don't need to get into all sorts of sophisticated theories about you know, capital productivity and things like that. Just like when I said, why does steak sell for more than hamburger? The answer is because people like steak more. And we can ask, you know, we can ask the psychologists or, or nutritionists, why is it that people like steak more? But as an economist, if you just tell me people, for whatever reason, like the steak more than the hamburger meat, that's all you need to know to say, okay, so that's going to sell for more um, in equilibrium. Okay, so the same thing here. If this is the case, well, then I just explained that earlier problem. That if you remember, going back to this sheet, this apparent paradox here, this land, labor, and capital goods on August 1st, 2008, that's not the same thing as a house available on August 1st, 2008. Really, that's equivalent to a claim on a future house. And so if I've already shown you, if I've convinced you that it's perfectly plausible that people would pay $110,000 for a house right now, but only $100,000 for a house that won't be available for one year, assuming that those preferences remain stable for a year, well, then these two numbers make perfect sense now. Because here, what you're doing when you buy the land, labor, and capital goods, in a sense, you're buying a technological claim on a future house, so you only pay $100,000 for it. But then after a year passes, in a sense, that has matured into a present house. 
And we already know that people pay $110,000 for a present house. Okay, so that is the essence of Bambavrik's solution to the interest problem, is that present goods, as a general rule, are preferred. They give higher utility than future goods. than the same thing not available until a certain amount of time has passed. Okay, so again, it's, I just, I just want to stress that, you know, people, this is an incredibly complex area. It's, it's literally been called the black hole of economics, capital and interest theory. And again, it's because of all these different time periods and there's all sorts of complicated things that get involved, but this is the essence of the problem that if you just for a moment forget about the production technologies and just say how much would people pay even in equilibrium when everything settles down for a good available today or a good available not, uh, you know, until the future, then as long as you agree that, yeah, it would make, there'd be a lower price paid for the, the claim, that solves the interest problem, right? And so that's what Austrians keep coming back to in terms of um, the explanation of interest. And that's why you can see here the productivity of these capital goods has absolutely nothing to do with it. It's ultimately driven by the subjective uh, valuations of, of consumers. Now, productivity is involved. For example, if, if somebody comes up with a way to, to build more houses, that might influence it. But by the same token, if somebody invents some new technology and all of a sudden steak becomes very uh, much easier to produce, but hamburger meat doesn't for some reason, if all of a sudden people can just churn out a lot more steak than they could last week, that also might lower the, the price advantage. You could even imagine that steak might become cheaper than hamburger. Okay, but even there, it would be because consumers would be consuming so much more, it would still be true that once things settle down, if steak now sells for less than hamburger, it's because consumers have a lower margin utility for that next pound of steak than they do for hamburger. So productivity and technological considerations might influence the marginal valuations by influencing the supplies of the various goods. So, so technology matters. It's not that Austrians say productivity has nothing to do with it, but the point is productivity works through the subjective valuations. And ultimately, the reason there's interest, according to the Austrians, is because present goods are more valuable than future goods. Okay, let me... Let's see, I'll do a little bit more, and then I'll stop for questions. So this, is, if you if you followed me up to now, that's great, I and mean, that's that's all you really need to get out of this. Let me just give a little bit of a technical digression to those of you. I know a lot of people here are, are economics um, grad students, and let me just, this will only take a minute. Um, so again, if you're an undergrad, don't worry about this. This is, this is going to be difficult. Um, what happened, this happened to me in grad school, is you'll go there and you'll be learning these, these formal models, and what they'll do is they'll have um, output as a, as a function of capital and labor, and, and they'll have nice assumptions about what this function F is like, its properties, so that things make sense that you get, uh, you know, what constant return to scales, perhaps, or whatever, the, whatever they want to make the solution nice and to make it somewhat economically plausible. And then you say, okay, well, how do we figure out what the wage rate is? And then that's pretty straightforward. It's down here. You just you take the derivative of the production function with respect to the labor input. And so, yeah, the marginal contribution of labor. How much does output total output go up if you put in a little bit more labor? And then that is the return to labor if, if, if the labor market's competitive. And we don't like the math and the calculus, but... Austrians could say, okay, that's 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 basically right. You know, we believe that labor gets its marginal product um, in terms of payments in a competitive market. Okay, but then the mainstream economist says, but what are you Austrians talking about? This you don't like the productivity theory of interest. If you accept that, well, then how can you possibly deny this? Because in this model's framework, how can you deny that if you um, put in a little bit more capital? then output goes up a little bit, and if the, if the capital market's competitive, then that means the net return to capital is the derivative of the production function with respect to K. And it's a perfectly analogous to what's going on with wages. So, yeah, you, I know you don't like formal models and things like that, but if, if you grant the basic correctness of the wage explanation, why don't you grant that ultimately the, the real interest rate is due to the productivity of capital? And the answer is um, because in this model they've done a little trick here in order to simplify things, they've assumed that there's only one, that, that the capital good and the production good are the same thing. That the example they might use are, are sheep. They'll say, suppose you've got 100 sheep and you can consume them in the present, but if you don't, they just physically, because of natural reproduction, will grow by 5% a year. 
And so that gives you the trade-off. And then if you try to say, well, in that sort of hypothetical economy, what is the rate of return on capital in real terms? And you say, well, the only, the only good there is is units of sheep. And so it's got to be the case in equilibrium that, you know, one sheep now trades for 1.05 units of sheep next year. Because if, you know, it'll physically turn into that. And that's what's got to be in equilibrium. Otherwise, there'd be an arbitrage opportunity for somebody. And so the mainstream kind of says, see, I've got you. You just admitted that those physical facts pin down what the real interest rate has to be. And so that's all we're saying. And Bombavrik's pages and pages of text can't alter that basic fact. But really, he's still right that um, it, it, what happens is, and I'm not going to get into it now, obviously, but what's going on here is the one way to get rid of Bombavrik's critique is to assume that the capital good and the output good are the same thing. So in the case where there's just one good in the economy, his critique doesn't really, it's not relevant. All right, that you, you can't have the problem of the capital good being priced differently in terms of the output good. But if you relax the assumption and you have just two goods in the economy, or three or four or any up to infinity, then his critique still works. And so it's the mainstream economists think that they're doing this harmless simplification by assuming one good to make the math easier, but actually they've honed in on the one theoretical possibility where Bombardier's critique's not really relevant, whereas if they just did it with two goods, you, you could perfectly illustrate his critique with equations, right? So it's the reason I'm going over this is I don't want I don't want you to come out of this week thinking, yeah, mainstream economists are right when it comes to, to mathematical equations, but the Austrians are right in terms of words, and you know the, the equations make a lot of stupid assumptions, so I don't believe them. I trust the words, and I mean that that is true to an extent, but I'm saying here you don't have to concede that if you're in grad school and your professor is showing you this and you and you think that okay yeah in math it's correct that the productivity theory works with math no it's not i mean that's what part of what i did in my dissertation was to show if you just assume two goods bombavrik you know i can show you the equation that bombavrik is right and there's a term in there that you can't just assume that the real interest rate is due to this derivative of the production function okay so again this is a technical digression but my point is this economic theory is true and if someone tries to model it with math so long as the math really is capturing what it's supposed to be then um, you'll you'll see that the insights can still be can still be demonstrated.